Okay, now let's welcome Mr. Edward Priest to deliver speech on technology innovation drives business restructuring. Let me bring you to the 1990s. At that moment, business process reengineering was the most popular business fad. It was a new approach. Companies were falling behind, and they were looking for a new recipe. This promised companies a new way to do business, a new way to organize themselves that would help them become more customer responsive, and of course, respond better to the needs of shareholders. The idea behind this new methodology was to rebuild the processes in the organization. Over years, Companies were running around processes doing the same things over and over and not adapting technology. We need to use new methodology. We needed to start with a blank slate, with a new process and start from the scratch. Many of them adapted this new approach. Michael Hammer from MIT and Jane Champy from Harvard University became the most sought after apostles of this new trend. In particular, their book, Reengineering the corporation became a bestseller. For more than 41 weeks, this book was on top of the New York Times bestseller list. Equally, the influence of Michael Hammer on business allowed him to become Times top 25 person of most influence in America in 1996. Business process reengineering became one of the most sought after trends in management. Books, journals, consulting companies adapted this new approach. And companies, of course, were very interested to listen because they were looking for new ways to approach customers. If you were looking at a competition around the world, at that time, Asian companies were getting into American markets. American companies were very interested in improving their performance, which was lagging at that time. The idea behind business process engineering was to start from a blank slate. There were processes that were already supporting organizations for so long, and that's what BPR wanted to replace. We wanted to organize the company in a new way, serving directly the customers. Companies were becoming sluggish and now responding to new trends. They were not adapting automation, for example, and that's something that business process engineering emphasized for companies to succeed in the years ahead. The main assumption behind this trend was that processes in the organization were not optimal. That might have been true. Question, why do we need to have optimal process that might last for decades when the only constant today in the world is change? These are the kids who make me the happiest dad in the world. Even though they were brought up under the same roof, they happen to be so different. My boy, for example, who is seven likes robots and anything with a remote control. My daughter, who is six, likes all about pink, all about dolls. And when I was writing this, she corrected me and said, Daddy, you're forgetting something. I also like to learn about a periodic table. My baby, of course, she's going to dinosaurs and singing songs in both English and Chinese. What do you want to be when you grow up? The typical answer is going to be, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a firefighter, I want to be an astronaut. Those are typical answers that kids usually give you, because that's what they are watching in cartoons, in the TV, online as well. But guess what? We don't know about the job market in the future, because it's changing so fast thanks to the progress of science and technology. So instead of specifically asking them to focus on one particular occupation or potential role, I always bring them the world of the unknown. I wanted to be open-minded. I wanted to think that many of the jobs that will be successful in the future don't exist today. So I ask my children to be open-minded and to think about big inventors and entrepreneurs in the world. Think about the Wright brothers. Think about Bill Gates, Elon Musk. Chan Jiming, these people actually created new industries. And in the process, they created a plethora of new jobs that never existed before. Can you think about jobs 20 years ago, like cloud computing architect, search marketing optimization specialist, big data analyst, for example? 
those chairs didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Guess what? Today are so popular. So that also tells you that in the next decades, new jobs that we don't know of today will become the most popular and the most relevant for the progress of the world. No type of innovation in technology has been brought to us due to business restructuring. Instead, technology innovation is coming to us thanks to human ingenuity. It was 1940 when Otto Hahn, a German chemist, discovered nuclear fission. The possibility that a single neutron colliding with uranium-235 would be able to decompose the nucleo into two smaller nuclei, barium and krypton, releasing an enormous amount of energy and also three additional neutrons. In turn, these neutrons will hit other uranium-235, which in turn would release additional energy and more neutrons, creating a change reaction. This was an amazing feat for mankind, and that led Orohan to receive the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 1944. Technology innovation can be thought of as this neutron. When it hits an organization that is probably sluggish and reactive enough to consumers, technology innovation can cause organizations to go through a similar process, organizational fission, and by that, they can create an explosion not of nuclear energy, but of organizational energy. If you can look at the case of Biden's, for example, recently there are reports that the private value of the company is bordering 400 billion US dollars. There is a reason why Biden's is called the app factory. They started 10 years ago with one single app. What was back then a small feature in that app became another app, and another app, and another app. Today, ByteDance is one of the few companies in the world who can count 2 billion users globally. Let me bring you back to this scene. Shang Jimin was still not well known. He visited America with other fellow Chinese entrepreneurs. He was invited to give a speech where Facebook, the company that we now call Meta. Nobody thought at that moment that Shang Jimin would create a company that eventually would rival Facebook in social media and many other aspects. Shen Jimin's visit to America persuaded him that China was actually onto something, that the decade that was coming would become the Chinese decade for technology companies. In fact, he discovered that many Chinese people in America were already using some of his popular apps, and they were appreciated by the users. That's when he realized that the execution by Chinese companies not only equal to American companies, but maybe even better. And that was what gave him hope to continue pursuing his dream to create a global company. How Chinese companies became so good? Because they were facing competition day in, day out. Every time a company in China would develop a new product, immediately dozens of copycats would try to replicate that. At the end of the day, the winner was the one preferred by the users. It was a perfect Darwinian jungle. So what would happen now if we bring this level of external competition inside the organization? In the same way that companies compete in the marketplace to become the preferred companies for users, why do we think of this level of competition inside? When we reorganize the organization, when we apply the organizational fission concept, companies divide themselves, not through functional processes, but through teams, initiatives that can grow from small ideas, small features to businesses inside the organization. Some of them might be sure bets in the short term. Some of them might be long term, but nonetheless, you create a combination of initiatives and that's what can create value for the organization overall. Let's imagine we are in the middle of a board of directors session. The directors of the company are looking at the different projects in the organization and they want to decide what type of initiatives we can support and what type of initiatives we can actually close. When these initiatives in the organization are organized through teams, each of these teams manager will be a mini CEO because he will have the ultimate responsibility about the success of this team. Equally, this manager will have the attribution to get resources from the company and access the best talent. When you have this autonomy in each of these teams, and when you have this access to resources and talent, you have performance, and that's what you need. So your best managers stay in the organization. 
They are not afraid of reorganizations or layoffs or downsizing. They see opportunities in a small business inside the organization and they grow it. They expand it and they become successful in managerial roles. So when the CEO of an organization is managing a number of teams, his role is going to be different. Now he needs to assign resources to the most promising initiatives, which eventually will turn into solid businesses. If there are some initiatives that are not performing well, those will need to be closed. The role of the CEO will be the resource allocator in the organization. Equally, the role of senior management and the board director changes because now they become VCs, the internal venture capitalists in the organization. They are the ones who are going to decide which of these initiatives perform well, will assign resources, will assign talent. If these initiatives are not doing well, we need to definitely cut this off. So it's this active process that eventually leads us to the BIDAS example. Organizational efficient is not an approach for all organizations. CEOs will need to change the culture of their organizations. For example, as a CEO, would you be able to pay your best performers more than what you get in annual salary? Would you be able to reallocate your resources very quickly between different projects from underperformers to outperformers? That is something that demands a change in the culture of the organization. It is a dangerous course, but nonetheless, the rewards can also be enormous. There are only three companies in the world that have crossed that $2,000 billion valuation. Microsoft, Apple, and Google, Alphabet. That can only give you an idea how important technology is in the world today. Technology innovation is that neutron that will actually collide into today's sluggish organizations and bring them to the future. That's the only way for SME companies to become the unicorns of today and the giants of the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for Mr. Edward for your critical thinking and wonderful speech.